What's good and welcome back to the channel. My name's Anas, I'm a fourth year medical student studying in London. And yes, I did get a haircut. I thought I'd try to live the stress-free lifestyle for a bit, but let's move away swiftly from that. Today's video, I thought I would talk about a common problem that faces any student or anyone who's trying to learn a new skill or new knowledge. And that is that you spend three, four, five months trying to study for an exam or learn a new language. You've put in intense amount of hours and hard work and you get to the exam, you get your results and to your surprise, you've done well below what you expected. And that might be because of how efficient your learning was during those hours of study. And as a medical student, you have so much work and you have so much information that you need to learn that you are forced to become really efficient in your learning. So in today's video, I thought I will talk a bit about how to improve the efficiency of learning and studying uh, through some tried and tested methods that I've used and other people have used and also some psychological principles. So in terms of the structure of today's video, I will initially just cover some information about memory in general, short-term memory, long-term memory, uh, and some models that have helped us uh, understand that. And then moving on from that, I will talk about some tips and techniques uh, that can help propagate the transfer of knowledge from the short-term stores into the long-term memory and how to better retrieve information from the long-term memory as well. So hopefully that should be extremely useful for students, for people trying to learn a language, for people who are trying to learn anything new. So unlike physical organs or biochemical processes or cellular processes or whatever, anything to do with the body, memory has been actually quite elusive in history. Uh, and it's been quite difficult to understand. But that doesn't mean that there hasn't been a lot of research in order to try and understand memory. So in order to help us better understand memory, psychologists have come up with models in order to explain the components of memory and how they work together. So overall what you have is the short-term memory and the long-term memory. Miller in 1956 in fact found that the short-term memory has an extremely limited capacity of about just seven items plus or minus two. So seven things that you can hold in your short-term memory only and in fact you only hold them for a couple of seconds. So how does information go from outside into the short-term memory? So you have the sensory components, so you have your eyes and your mouth and your ears and those bring in information so whatever you see whatever you hear uh, and also your taste and other things so to give an example suppose you are in a group teaching session the information that you're getting from your senses is a lot so it's about everything you're seeing the room the colors the lights the door the people that are there you're also hearing information from lots of different people all the noise the seven items that you focus on are the ones that go into your short-term memory and your short-term memory roughly is made up of three components so uh, the two main ones are the phonological loop and that I know that sounds a bit complex but all that is is the auditory information you get and also things to do with words and numbers so that kind of information then you also have the visual spatial sketch pad and I know that sounds complex too but in simple terms it's all to do with your spatial awareness where things are in space so where where maybe where information is is it at the back of your book at the front of your book and then you have the central executive and this just coordinates all the information between those two stores and also helps transfer the information into the long-term store it also helps retrieve information from the long-term memory into your short-term memory. That is, in simple terms, how memory has been modelled. And part of that model is known as the working memory model and was modelled by Badley and Hitch quite a while back. I can't remember the date exactly. So the thing that we want to pinpoint here is how do you maximise the amount of information that is transferred from the short-term memory, from the uh, phonological loop, from the vi visual spatial sketch pad, into the long-term memory and how do you make it easier to retrieve information from the long-term memory whenever you really want it whenever you're sitting in that exam how do you uh, retrieve that information easier if you're talking to someone in a new language how do you better use that long-term memory in order to speak to someone well let me tell you what techniques do not work it doesn't work to just reread your notes over and over and over again 50 100 times and it kind of makes you feel quite good and you feel like you're working 
that doesn't really work according to lots of evidence and there's an excellent video by uh, another medical student on YouTube uh, and I'll link that below and that's by Ali Abdal and he talks about why that doesn't work. What also doesn't work is going through your notes and highlighting lots of things. What you actually want to do is you want to process that information into the knowledge that you already have. You want to form a mental network of all the information you have and add new information onto that. And here's a common mistake that happens a lot. Let's say again I'm in a group teaching session and let's use an, a, a medical example. So when I'm in uni we have some teaching sessions with uh, consultants and professors and often these people are really good teachers and they'll cover some specific conditions in real detail and at that stage I feel like wow uh, my understanding of this topic has really clicked as this professor is explaining this topic I decide to take some three four word notes on my notepad okay I feel like I've written something down that will help me remember it later on then I don't look at these notes for like three four months and then when I look at them, lo and behold, I can't even remember the conversation. I can't remember what we talked about at all. I can't even remember the understanding that I had at that stage. And the big mistake I did there was I never looked back at it straight away after that teaching session. And that is probably because it takes a bit of effort and it's a bit of laziness there. What I actually should have done is gone back home or gone to the computer room or gone to the library after that teaching session and then written down my understanding uh, of that topic and also written it in a way that will help me remember everything that we talked about maybe a month or two months later and also what I should do is I should explore that topic in a bit more detail and also I should probably incorporate that knowledge into the notes that I have already so if you've spoken about the complications of diabetes in that, that in that session then I should probably take that knowledge and put it into the notes of my diabetes section on that day not only have I produced a network of knowledge in my mind, but also I've gone through it a second time, which reinforces the knowledge. I've added some contextual uh, kind of memory to it because now whenever I think about the complications of diabetes, I will actually remember that I had a teaching session with this consultant on this day, and so I've further reinforced that information. The tip there is to straight away tackle new knowledge that you get on the same day. And the second technique you can use in order to help improve uh, information going into the long-term memory is to use something called active recall. And again, there's plenty of evidence to say that uh, doing practice questions and retrieving information actively from your long-term stores help uh, further solidify that information in the long-term memory and there's a number of ways you can do that one of the ways is you can use flashcards and that's actually quite a useful thing to do uh, and you can have them in lots of different colors and so on the other way you can do it is using some apps on your phone uh, and recently I've used uh, an app that is called Quizlet and it's been quite useful for me on that app I can create sets of questions uh, that I can go through it's quite visually pleasing it works on my laptop works on the phone so I can go through it on the go as well uh, and also it allows for space repetition so I can go through some questions um, at different time intervals so maybe I'll go through it um, after two days and then after five days and after ten days and that is how it brings up the questions if you want but the game changer technique for me uh, and the one that I solidly kind of vouch for and has worked anyway is to use the old school technique of using a notepad. So the way I do this is uh, maybe a month before the exams, I will buy two to three notepads. I will concisely put one line questions of my whole syllabus in that notepad and I'll fill maybe two notepads for my whole year syllabus. A month before the exam, I'll go through the notepad covering the answers for the questions and then I'll read the question for, to myself and I'll answer it and check if it was right. And maybe when I start off, it might take me a whole day to go through the two or three notepads. Then maybe a week later, it, I can go through the notepad maybe three to four times in a day, maybe a week and a half, five to ten times. And actually what's quite amazing is that as I'm getting closer to the exam, I don't need to use the notepad as much. Actually, I can probably tell you where the questions are in that notepad, what the answers are to those questions. As I get even closer, I could probably go through it 30, 50 times. And again, remember that I've probably put my whole syllabus in those two, three notepads. And through that technique, 
uh, I'm using active recall and also this links back to why I explained memory earlier on because in this case I'm using the phonological loop because it's the actual words and the letters uh, of that information that I've encoded um, and also I'm using the visual spatial sketchpad because I know where those questions are in that book where they're located is it at the back in the middle at the front which of those notepad is it and so if someone ever asked me what antibiotic do you use to treat a uh, just a general pneumonia then I know exactly where that question is which page it is and where the answer is and I can see it uh, if someone asks me what are the complications of a specific condition then I can see it because I wrote it down in a specific section of that notepad and for me that is efficient because I'm using two stores instead of one in comparison to if I use an app then it's just a screen and, I'm, and I don't get the same spatial awareness. Tip number three is to use the Feynman technique and the principle here is that you don't truly understand the topic until you can explain it in simple terms to someone else. And the way I use this technique is either once I've covered a topic, then I will explain it to myself in a room alone, and make sure no one else is there because they might look at you funny and you're like talking to yourself and that's a bit weird. So I'll do that alone and I'll lock the doors and then I will challenge myself in areas that I feel maybe I don't understand as well. For example, let's go through diabetes again. And one of the complications of diabetes is kidney problems. Now, I can just learn that diabetes is linked to kidney problems. On the other hand, if I really want to challenge myself, then I can ask myself, why is that the case? Because that is a, a normal question someone else would have asked me if I explained it to them. And so in this case, you need to be quite self-aware and make sure that you're not fooling yourself because uh, apparently one of the other quotes, I'm not sure if it's by Feynman, but uh, the easiest person to fool is yourself. So don't fool yourself and make sure you're actually challenging yourself. Apart from this, the next step of this would be to explain this topic to someone else and probably someone who understands this topic better than you because what they can do then is challenge you on simple stuff and on complex stuff and really find the holes in your knowledge. In addition to this, a, an excellent technique that I use uh, during exam season, actually something I use this year, actually not this year, but the, the year, uh, whatever, last year, let's say last year. Something I used last year was to do group sessions, but not like learning together. What we would do actually is prepare lots of questions uh, for each other and these are questions that we solidly know the answers to and then I would ask the other person the question, they would answer it and explain the answer to me. Now, if I feel like they haven't explained it adequately, then I would challenge them. If they feel like I haven't explained it well, they would challenge me and so on and would co go through that session. And tip number four is to do with sleeping adequately. And I'm not gonna lie, I have also fallen victim to this because you kind of feel like you're doing lots of work. You're like, oh, I'm sleeping at two. I'm waking up at five. I only slept five hours. I only slept four hours. Oh, I'm so sick, da, da, da. No, you're not sick. What the research has shown is that actually sleep deprivation, whether acute or chronic, has a massive impact on your cognitive abilities, whether that be your ability to stay attentive to a task, your focus, your reflex time. But what's more important is to do with a long-term memory and it affects your ability to retrieve information from the long-term stores and it also affects your ability to take that information, process it and put it into the long-term memory as well because uh, I think they've done some scans and lots of things while you're sleeping and they've seen that, oh, you're, uh, you're actually processing that information and transferring it into, into your memory, da da da. So you need to make sure you're sleeping uh, at least seven to eight hours uh, and don't gas yourself, please. And there are some things I deliberately did not go into detail to, uh, like the Feynman technique uh, and some other things. I might do that in a separate video, but I hope this was a comprehensive view of how you can really increase the efficiency of your study time. Uh, a big one is try to reduce distraction, and that is probably a separate video as well. But I hope you really liked the video. If you liked the video, then make sure you subscribe to the channel. Um, yeah, safe.